Oh, cool. They crack the crowd. Some of the lesser security stuff, but he's the all around business dude that stuff with uh, stuff with the Oh, awesome. Oh, who did you bring to you, Tom? Um, well, the, the first live broadcast um, from Sundance was, I had something to do with, and um, the first um, live music during the U.S. Film Festival from Main Street, um, I brought in uh, Black Flag and Dead Kennedy, so, uh, 1986. So, now I guess... <laughs> Yeah, so, so the Memorial Building where Park City Live is, I had the first liquor licenses there. I had 17 liquor licenses there from 1986 until 2000. I successfully upgraded my wife. Sorry, we are on live broadcast in 2000, and I um, um, made a deal with her that uh, no more bar business after that. So, um, I've been involved in streaming media. No more music than that? Well, we, we um, started uh, in 2000. Uh, uh, with Akamai and Microsoft, um, we worked with uh, Ed McMahon and uh, Drew Carey and started doing the, the, um, the precursor to uh, the uh, reality show that's in Class Comic Sandy right now from the improv. We, we did um, the first um, uh, beauty pageant streaming live. Um, it's really tough to convince your wife that you miss her when you're in a tuxedo with a microphone um, um, interviewing um, girls in bikinis. Um, so, no, I, I still have something to do with that. I've been working in crowdfunding space. I, I, I dabbled in a lot of things, but right now um, my passion is rural um, uh, job creation. And um, cool. Scott's uh, one of our. Um, Scott's from uh, Dover's office right now. So, I don't know if clubs. Did I get it right? <laughs> Miller County. Miller. Miller. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, in, in 2008, after the economic downturn, uh, I was uh, contracted by a group out of Hildale, Colorado City, to uh, basically uh, help them architect their systems. And, uh, had 70 people working in, um, in uh, that area. We brought in a fiber line and a wisp. That's a cause and Yeah, yeah. Colorado City? Yeah. I was soaking jumps up. Great yeah. people. Yeah. Pretty cool. This just was my taste. Wow. Are you the only one? Yeah. We'll get this started in a little bit. People have to see how they're already already playing. So those of you out there um, listening to the broadcast, you want me to put up an opportunity for you to have a, a, a chat or something like that? Hit me up for it. Um, let's see. Do I need to sit in front of that screen so they can see me, or can I sit here? Um, you, the best place for you to be would be um, on that podium, okay. if, if that's cool with you. That's cool. And um, to uh, attach to the uh, projector, too, got the HDMI cable. Sad, how are you, buddy? Good to see you. She does have a pretty interesting goatee, but I don't want to get through here. But there you go. I'm still working on it. I, uh, he just sent me a picture of when we were there, and I had a good thing, but I haven't looked for dress in a while. that chest head right now. Can you ask, uh, would you just look at that screen and see if it's relatively square, and are there little green bars at the bottom? No. Test, 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 test. Oh, yeah. Uh, Ow! Okay, looks like you can see it on there, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you talk? I'll see if I got enough sound coming from you. Bring your mouth up just a little bit. Your volume. No, no, it's right here. But just talk a little bit louder. Oh, project. Project. Want me to get closer to? Yeah. Move this way a little. Does that give me enough time? Yeah. All right. As I do know. 
a little bit about today's subject matter. Thor, welcome. Um, I'll uh, get started as I do anticipate people to filter in. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Jobs Act, which was passed in March of 2012? Okay. How many of you have fascination because you're CPAs and you're wondering how many K-1s you're going to have to worry about? Now? That would be you. <laughs> so the Jobs Act was enacted so you could have small investors that were not um, accredited investors, and I believe that the clarification is still a million dollars in net worth, two hundred thousand dollars in two hundred fifty k per person per year. So the only way you could get into a startup venture is if you were putting in friends or family money, and you wouldn't be able to have any type of going public or equity status unless you were of a certain social class. So in the spring of 2012, um, the crowdfunding made simple um, conference was held here in Utah. It was actually held up at um, the uh, University of Utah Alumni Room. And many of the authors of um, the crowdfunding um, act, which became the Jobs Act, have Utah ties, Dan included, who um, won't give you any type of the same type of accolades about himself that I will. He's basically a crowdfunding badass, excuse me. Um, the actual group that created the Frankenstein Bill, how many are you familiar with the Frankenstein Bill? The, the Jobs Act legislation they put into effect, the SEC wouldn't approve unless certain um, treatments of how you could do the investment were taken into place. So crowdfunding advisors uh, contracted with Dan and other individuals to come up with something that would be friendlier for the SEC. In a nutshell, two and a half years after it was signed into law, it's actually three and a half, no, it's two and a half, because it was March of 2012. So two and a half years. Um, after the Jobs Act, which is jumpstart our um, Business startups um, was um, signed into law, became law. Um, there were different tranches and clarifications of the act that were um, uh, brought into law over the last two and a half years. Mm -hmm. But as of last Friday, uh, two Fridays ago, and within a 90 day quiet period, an entrepreneur like me that is not an accredited investor will be able to actually invest in a startup. It's pretty neat stuff. And um, Dan is going to present on that. Other things that he does with Crack the Crowd, a little bit of pedigree. Dan, um, he was the creator of Love Sack. He will say he was a co creator, but he was much more <laughs> than that. Um, he uh, also brought frozen Greek yogurt to America with Canadra. Is that true? And, <laughs> and he's um, uh, also now involved in food grade um, dog food. So human grade dog food um, with a startup called uh, Pyotes. And so I'm generally kind of hyper and frenetic um, from a Salt Lake Circle standpoint and have way too many balls in the air. I can't even compete with this guy. It's crazy. A uh, little bit of um, 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 uh, housekeeping beforehand. Tuesday, um, I would recommend you come to our marquee event of Design Bank Building. Fire Toss is going to be doing a presentation on marketing boot camp, basically getting your content in order. Um, Tony Passi is a professor at the U of Marketing. Um, he's in the MBA program. Well worth the effort if you haven't been to one of our marketing events. Um, we are also supporting Big Data Utah, which has the uh, Big Data Mountain Conference. If any of you are interested in programming any aspect of that, it is a free event, a fantastic event. The Spencer Eccles Building on Saturday the 21st. We um, also have our um, um, Salt Lake Crawl event coming up. We're going to kind of have it a little bit earlier because of Thanksgiving. We typically do a twist, and that's next week. And without any more ado, I'm on behalf of SL Circle. I welcome Dan Baird talking about now what? I uh, appreciate that, Joel. Thank you. Always sells me way better than I could ever sell myself. Thank you. Appreciate it. Buddy. Um, so, yeah, as Joel mentioned, I do a business and startup strategy specifically in crowdfunding. Um, my company, Craft the Crowd, basically helps people get off the ground, launch platforms, launch campaigns, raise money, navigate this entire space, which is really, really cool. Um, as far as innovation goes, you know, there's a handful of guys like, you know, Peter Drucker and uh, uh, a lot of like kind of the 
The biggest names in technology will look to a handful of kind of exponential growth sectors, and crowdfunding is always on that list. It's top three, one of the coolest things you can watch. Um, I'm going to go, actually, I'll show you a little bit why. Because how many people really know what the Jobs Act is? I was actually surprised. This is inside baseball, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm excited that there's this is more kind of a general appeal thing. Um, I'll run through a little bit, do a little bit of a deeper dive from Joel's to help kind of sort this stuff out. But what we have here is super interesting stuff. This is going to start a ton of new businesses. It's, I mean, for me, it's a very big deal. Countries are integrating crowdfunding into their economic strategies to regain growth. Italy is trying to use crowdfunding to grow their economy again because their population statistics, they don't have enough kids to basically support continuous positive growth and they have to look to other venues and, and uh, methods to do it. And crowdfunding is one of them. Uh, this is one of the most useful, virtuous technologies on the planet, I put it on par with like having the internet itself. This is big, this is cool, cool stuff. Um, and because of this, we are getting cheaper businesses that are starting up with higher quality kind of business plans. The transparency means that fraud is a lot harder to get away with than people would let you what you believe. Um, and uh, we're at the, the tip of probably one of the coolest innovation trends I expect to see in the next 10, 20 years. So, this stuff's super, super cool. Um, really fun to be excited and, and really fun to be a, a part of it. Um, let's get the close stuff. How much time do we have, Joe? I want to make sure that I don't. We try to keep this to an hour, but as many of the people that are here know, we will sometimes keep that to about 1.30. If we can get the majority to meet done okay. by 1 o'clock, that would be fine. Cool. And we'll go from there. Cool. We'll jump through the, this stuff really quick. Does everyone know what crowdfunding itself is? This is many hands making light lifting. This is disintermediation and, and technology is now taking the spot of a lot of manual jobs to make aggregating even really, really, really small amounts of money useful and still economically viable. So when you guys go, you, you can see people that are using it as word of mouth marketing um, techniques. Yeah, Joe, you worked on the Dodge Dart campaign? Yes, um, we uh, were the first group to come up with a mid merchant ID number for a top 50 um, Fortune 50 company Chrysler to utilize crowdfunding for much like a wedding registry, you could have people buy your car. Awesome. And it uh, premiered during the Super Bowl in 2013. Awesome. So big business is basically realizing the word of mouth marketing is in many ways 10 times more effective than anything else they have available. They need to figure out how to crack that. Uh, millennials, you know, people that are 31 years and younger are basically looking at 45 minutes of static advertising on a daily basis and guess what they're getting good at? Filtering it, not even noticing that it's there. Uh, things like word of mouth, social media posts that are on behalf of or integrate the, the, the genuine and authentic kind of uh, um, referrals from people that they know, that stuff works. That's what's really, really hard to fake. Um, so if you're in business right now and you are looking for, hey, what's the best way that I can spawn and kind of push more uh, business and marketing, this is the way to do it. And obviously, you know, Chrysler's noticing. Donations, if you guys have heard GoFundMe, this is where people, um, this is usually on a personal level, people have bills, a death in the family, and they help people raise for all types of stuff in this space, where basically they have a family or a friend in need, they can all get together, and because of, again, the technology and the economics of it, you can donate a dollar and it's effective. You're not wasting your time by giving someone a dollar. The transaction costs still make it economically viable. We have rewards and the product validation stuff that you guys see on Kickstarter. Really, really cool because this stuff is like going and putting your idea out there before you have to spend all the money purchasing inventory and doing everything else. You get a really viable read on how good your idea is before you even have to buy inventory. Um, if you guys are watching the news recently, there's a printer called the Glowforge. This is like kind of a 3D laser cutting printer. So instead of producing ink on a page, it cuts objects out. You lay cardboard in there, it goes through, does its little thing, and it cuts out pieces. Um, it just raised $28 million in 30 days. This is the equivalent of, I, I have a prototype. Will you guys give me $28 million based on the premise that I will eventually send you a printer once it arrives? You're willing to wait three months to get it. That guy didn't dilute his cap table. Uh, they have a very solid, huge business. They've lowered their risk. They've made their logistics chain way more efficient. They can now turn around and say, I need to order X number of printers, not more, not less. This is how much money I have. It makes businesses way more efficient. Um, and it makes startups way more efficient. Uh, if you have an idea, you can go and spend five or 10 grand making a prototype, uh, putting it out there, getting a read based on the, uh, the, the market pickup on a Kickstarter or otherwise. If it doesn't fund, cool. Don't throw any more money at it. 
do a plug for the boys in the back corner. Well, Gonics is in this office, uh, and those guys focus on basically the logistics, the supply chain, and the prototype development of your product. And I work with them to do branding, development, messaging, strategy, or your crowdfund campaign. But those guys will basically say, hey, you have an idea and you have some sketches, I'll turn it into a working prototype. We can then film the video and turn it into a crowdfunding campaign. Again, it's way more efficient. Your, your rates of success are way more predictable, and you're only spending money that you have to instead of going to some manufacturer and dropping $2 million on inventory you hope you can sell, but don't have any idea yet. Um, <clears throat> then we have peer-to-peer -peer lending. Stuff like Prosper, where people can do small business loans. SOPI, if you guys have heard of that, is now taking a lot of student loans, and they're allowing people to roll their, their student loans into lower interest rates. Um, and they're allowing investors to invest in student interest-bearing loan accounts, which have great returns and actually really reliable returns. And then uh, there's equity and debt. So this is the Jobs Act. Okay, so those are the kind of the different options of crowdfunding you have available to you. Um, if you're a brand new business and you're starting to go through, you're kind of wondering where do I start, where do I go? start i would suggest at the kickstarter level because you can build traction with your company you can establish revenue you don't have to have a prior history you need to have some experience you know um but uh you can use this to go generate an idea and if you have a really really big one the venture capitalists the angel investors start contacting you not the other way around and you get a more favorable valuation based on it too so your company's worth more um and once you've done that uh your next option is peer-to-peer lending anybody here tried to get a bank loan from a bank for their business and we need to bother trying to in many cases. <laughs> How's it go? No problem. Uh, liar. No, just kidding. Um, if you go look, a lot of the statistics will put, uh, I'm paraphrasing, so pardon me if I get the actual number wrong, but they put uh, using bank financing, I believe it was number eight on their list of order of options to gain financing. Like it's so low on that list that people are going, why? I'm not even going to bother, right? Without, you know, in my experience, banks love to loan you money as soon as you don't need it. You know, uh, as soon as you've got everything, it's like, again, we're in a great situation. We don't need money now. Just stay here. Right? Yeah. Cool. Um, your peer-to-peer -peer lending and your equity and debt financing is what the Jobs Act has enabled. Uh, just a quick heads up on regional shares. This is how it works globally. Uh, you guys can actually see the other countries in there. You can't somehow. But this is North America, 9.4 billion. We're leading, but 145% growth year over year. Don't mind if it do. Um, <laughs> That is a really awesome market, and just so you know, you'll see maybe on the next slide. Um, 3.2 billion, uh, the EU, 3.4 billion in Asia. This doesn't, that's been 320% growth. Um, this stuff is taking off, and these numbers uh, have no real indicator of slowing down. They've doubled, they've doubled again, they've doubled again. How three just went live, I expect them to more than double again. Um, yeah, there you go. We went from last three years, uh, 6.116 6 to 34.4. So literally triple digit growth rates. Um, lending is growing, uh, depending on who you talk to, 270,000 new jobs based on crowdfunding. Um, the World Bank report put out by Crowdfund Capital Advisors estimates $96 billion uh, by uh, 2025. And uh, I can tell you, just because they didn't want to look stupid, they made that conservative estimate. So they didn't overdo it, and it's going to be better than that for sure. Um, so regulatory rollout, just a little bit more about just how it worked and the kind of timeline. Um, crowdfunding, we had our perks and donations, our Kickstarters, our Indiegogos. Uh, those regulatory-wise really have almost nothing. Like in many cases, if you see and participate in a Kickstarter campaign and they don't ship you product, um, there's only been one case where the FCC actually went after someone, but for the most part, you're giving that as almost like a good faith deposit that you're going to receive product at some point in the future. There's a lot of people that talk about there being fraud in that space and stuff, and most of the data, the people that have been studying this, uh, Ethan Mullick at uh, Wharton, um, they've found I think four global actual persecutions based on crowdfunding fraud. The reality is a bunch of people try. It does happen. A bunch of people do not succeed. Because what does that compare to, like in pink sheets or over the counter when it comes to profit? Oh, I don't know. I'll look that one up. I'll have to get back to you on that. But I don't know. But uh, uh, from their analysis, again, it's so much lower. There is an instance of a lot of inexperienced entrepreneurs that are putting out stuff. They're making promises that they don't realize that they can keep, but this is the nature of a startup. Uh, most of the time, when you see these really big campaigns that are Oculus Rift level stuff, they're shipping on average of eight months later than they were originally predicting to. Because the reality, what happens is if you went and put out a product, you went to raise, say, $100,000 on Kickstarter, and you raised $8 million, 
Uh, if your original supplier oftentimes can't even handle the existing quantity and they will just tell you to go find someone else. So a lot of your logistics and stuff is going up and stuff. You shut down campaigns and if you go look for the, the fraud case that you have there they oftentimes get shut off way before they actually get too far you know they have one where there was someone was trying to do kobe beef jerky out of africa so someone raised their hand there was an expert said oh by the way there's no kobe cows in africa so this is impossible campaign gets shut down another one guy trying to do a hologram until some nice little engineer chimes in and says this violates newton's third law shut down um so they actually catch them um and they stop them so a lot of that stuff gets prevented. So we had that one and that was established, not much regulation there. Title II came out. Title II was the original accredited investor version that Joel was talking about with high net worth individuals. The SEC, for lack of finding a better way to sort out who should be able to invest, who's, who's okay and whose money can we safely risk here, they chose accredited investors and basically they just said, oh, we'll just let rich people do it, which most of us in the space are pretty sad about because uh, I don't know about you guys, but I have rich friends and it doesn't have any sort of correlation with them being any smarter. Um, there's no causation principle there. Uh, you having money is not the same as you being an intelligent, wise investor. Um, so we were hoping for something that was a little bit more qualitative and, you know, do you understand the risks type of stuff. But for lack of a, of a better alternative, they put that out and they said, okay, so as long as you have that much money, we'll let you go out and invest. And that was what Title II did. And this one went live. This was October of 2013 when that one first one out. It's being utilized pretty well by, say, real estate firms, and most of the crowdfunding equity that you see out right now is based on this type of investment. The problem is, is those accredited investors are only eight or nine million people in the U.S. That's not a ton. Guess how many of the eight or nine million actively manage their own portfolios at all in the first place? Not that many. Um, so while they don't have any caps and that type of thing, it's great. It's a really limited subset of a limited group. Um, Title IV came out. This was, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on it because quite frankly, it's really hard to use. Um, you know, this was, this, this was meant to be kind of a mini IPO. It raised and kind of allowed you to get more non-accredited investors into your deal. But quite frankly, some of the other limitations they put on it meant that there's a couple of guys that actually did raise it via Reg A and it, the economics didn't make sense. In some cases, they actually spent, uh, it was as much if not, I can't remember. It was like they spent, oh, I wish I had the number here. It was uh, several hundred thousand dollars to do the raise of a several hundred thousand dollar raise. So they basically spent as much on legal fees as they did and retained from this. The whole thing. They got some great marketing out of it because they were the first to go, and that was probably their ultimate real goal, but way too expensive for it to be economically viable. Not that many investors. It didn't really do what it was supposed to accomplish. So there's a ton of people in this space. That just say, eh, you may not want water. And then Title III, um, sorry, slightly dated slide, but ETA January, we have about January 26th. Um, they've given us a handful of those preliminary laws. This is real crowdfunding. This is you guys getting to invest in startups in your neighborhood with equity. Um, this for us is very, very cool. This is a very, very good thing. I think this is actually going to spawn a ton of new innovation. I'm really excited for this. Um, we'll save some of the the details next. Do we have any questions so far? Sorry guys, I talked fast. So, I mean, you'll probably get into this, but what's the definition of a fund? No, no funds, meaning they didn't allow special purpose vehicles that would aggregate investor dollars and let a, let, anything at all. Yeah, you had to do individual. So this was one of the other reasons that a lot of people love that special purpose vehicle use. And a lot of that money, a ton, like a, you know, sovereign wealth funds and 401ks. I mean, there's so much institutional money out there. That would also be looking for these types of investments. Um, but if you can't take money because it's someone that's doing on behalf of an institution, uh, you're cutting out a ton of your other potential investors. So, yeah, regulated wouldn't let you use fund money. Any others? Cool. Um, title two, we covered this stuff, but uh, this one, for a timeline perspective of how we got to where we are, Title two. All those accredited investors created a great little uh, a great little environment, but because no one else could invest, 
uh, interstate happened, and a bunch of the country got mad at how long it was taking for this Title III to come out, and they went and did their own interstate rules. Uh, this stuff was a great idea. It was you know we can we can do uh, the Mile Act um, um, in uh, Minnesota, and you can invest in uh, in or Detroit, sorry, Michigan, um, and uh, you can go and invest as long as your company is in state and your bank is in state and your investors are in state, you can go and do that same real crowdfunding. Seemed like a great idea, but they wrote a lot of legislation that made it impossible. Um, meaning a lot of times it was re it's re still hard to find banks that will set up and do the transactions for us. Like we need escrow providers. It's, uh, it's oftentimes like the case in Texas right now, um, where they have a ton of crowdfunding platforms. They have a ton of crowdfunding deals, but there's only, I think, one bank that actually allows you to do it. So all of these people have to try to use that same bank. Um, and as a result, only I think two deals are actually live because of it. It's a really, really small number. It made it so it wasn't feasible. The reason that matters, uh, skipping reg A, is Title III fixed this. Um, so now, high level stuff. The SEC has learned they've been getting yelled at by a lot of industry professionals for two years now for screwing up the first two in the sense that, hey, you left out most of the country. Hey, you gave us an economic business model that's totally not viable and not affordable. Um, their original rules for a Title III raise is sure, anybody can participate, uh, but your startup can only raise a million bucks. Um, and oh, by the way, to protect the investors, we're going to throw we're going to put a bunch of audited financials and some other regulatory stuff that protects investors. We went and did the math and found out that maybe, you know, can you imagine doing a $50,000 initial audit and then you have to do ongoing audited financials in your startup, right? You do not have this level of cash and it made raising a million bucks. At the price of 150 grand, really not that interesting. Um, Title III came back, they clearly listened, and they've raised some of those limits, they've lowered some of those reporting requirements, they've actually made it much more economically viable for this to work. So, having seen a lot of these things that sounded great and then got hit and had the brakes pushed on them, um, Title III is a nice breath of fresh air for me. They still have some high regulatory hurdles. The US is still probably the hardest country on the planet to uh, raise equity funds for crowdfunding. Um, but this is a huge step in the right direction. A lot of us are very, very excited about this one. Um, the rules and what you can do here is, yes, you can raise money from anyone. Um, you can actually they raise their uh, maximum from 1 million to 5 million bucks, which means now, okay, so now we're talking. We can actually do A, angel round, B rounds. Um, and we've got enough money where we can have to help fund some of the expenses that come with doing a raise like this, like this ongoing reporting and investor management and stuff like that. Um, the investor max parishioner, they basically said, go ahead and raise money from whoever you want, uh, but it can only be up to 100K per investor. Um, issuers aren't required to file tax returns. A lot of this data has to be public. Um, if you went and wanted to raise money, if you wanted to invest in a company, it would be really relevant to you if they had tried to raise earlier, but they had tried to do another raise in a different context and it went sour on them, right? Um, and a lot of the things that you go through as an issuer when listing a deal is background checks to make sure that you aren't, you know, a bad actor. Um, in many cases, you have to disclose anyone that is uh, working with your company that owns more than a 20% stake. Like they go in and basically check out to make sure you're not uh, doing SEC violations or you don't have any actions against you in the past. Because if you do, you don't get to do these raises. Um, optional Q&A formats that issuers can use in disclosures. Awesome for me. These platforms already have this technology built in, and it allows that conversation of, hey guys, by the way, there are no Kobe cows in Africa to take place. So if someone spots that huge flaw in your business model, it can actually trickle out both to the platform and get to everybody else as well, um, and they can be notified in advance. Um, audited financial statements. So originally, this thing had audited financials, a really expensive thing for a startup to do. They don't have that 20K sitting around. Um, now, if it's your first round, you can just get reviewed financial statements. Way less expensive, way more viable, especially if you're, you know, you may be a startup that's pre-revenue, um, and that may be that may be the case. This again makes the economics of this make sense. Um, and then the uh, information about the officers, and then uh, required to annual report the commission and provide to investors. Same kind of thing. If you're going to go do this raise, you have to provide ongoing investor management reports that basically let everyone know how you're continuing to do. Um, that's the high level stuff of what matters. Do any of you guys know how you would plan on potentially using this either as an invest? I can go through. You guys want to get nitty gritty. Um, I have all the investor requirements, the issuer requirements, the 
platform requirements if you guys want to start your own platform? What's most interesting? Who out here right now is looking to raise money for their startup or their business? Okay. What type of stuff are you doing? Um, I guess it would, it's kind of it's a dating app for a couple. Cool. Um, it's a fake or make business success. You know that it's a make business success app. Very cool. It's a service. Okay. Um, and yes, I'm looking for any money for it. And this is great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's show you how you could potentially use this. Um, uh, how long has the company been in business? Uh, we'll be here in January. Okay, cool. So you're relatively new. Uh, we have no revenue. Pre revenue. Yeah, even better. Okay, cool. Yeah, okay, good. You basically want to keep the cap tables clean, and when you do generate that revenue, you want to own as much supply as possible, right? That's how it works. So I just talked to some people tonight about a possible 200K uh -huh. investment. Now, they have to be accredited investor. Yep. And all of that, but if they're not, then I have to go through taking them through the motions and making all that happen. Mm -hmm. Uh okay. Depends. Good consultant answers every question. Depends. Um there are different types of raises, some of which were already legal. If you had a pre existing relationship, they didn't have to be in the they made some allocations that would allow you to take money from friends and family. But the idea was that they were friends and family. They already knew you. They already had some other level of information that protected them from you being a scam, right? Uh, so that's one of the ways they would do it. But in your case, here's how I would think about this. I'm pre-revenue. I've got an app that's under development. The, the, I want to retain as much of the ownership as possible. I want to spend as little money as possible, right? Um, in, the, in the first context, I would probably think about, number one, I can throw it out and do the Kickstarter raise. And the really cool thing about that is friends and family are going to participate sure i'm going to go ask them they're going to help but the other investors number one don't have to be accredited which means anybody can potentially participate number two because of this being a web technology where everything is open and public it means they don't have to meet me personally ever i'll happily set up an investor call or do whatever else i need to but now geography no longer matters introductions to vcs no longer matter the next Google literally can now come out of a garage startup in Kansas. They don't have to be in Silicon Valley anymore with connections to Sand Hill Road and Stanford professors. Now this geography play no longer will have an effect like it used to. And it means you can participate on the same level and playing field that a startup straight out of Silicon Valley will look at all the money in the universe right around the front door. Okay, so yeah, I'm, we're gonna run a we're gonna run an ABO though. So cool. We're gonna wait until February to do it around Valentine. Um, the problem is in the interim, uh -huh. you know, we need operating capital uh -huh. to get some stuff done other than just doing leverage and sitting around on that equipment that tells you whether it's a mm -hmm. So in the interim, in order for me to take money from a private investor, it's not, it's not somebody has to pay, you know, mm -hmm. they like my idea, they... In those contexts, you probably rely on some of the, it's called 506B. You go talk to a securities attorney. This is one of the earlier ones where it'll allow, out, allow for friends and family types to raise it. And it's probably the one that you'd want to negotiate that one. You don't need to go like this stuff. And for very good reasons, because it's public and it's on the internet. And if you guys have watched Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns, like they're getting incredibly impressive. The the, the, high. the the bar has been phenomenally raised from even what we saw like with, with Pebble and stuff like that, and they're raising a ton more because of it. Um, you know, Coolest Cooler is doing what ten plus million. Um, that printer on his Forge printer did twenty eight million in thirty days. The scrotum um, sacks up to forty k, which is amazing. But that's a conversation for another day. Just <laughs> look, up, look, look up the yeah, look potato up. salad. Yeah, did sixty grand. Sure. So how does all of these, how do all these title movements affect the accelerated like, Y Combinator, Texas, 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 Because now these guys, so you have two different problems and there's two different little little uh, groups. There's basically incubators, which are pre-revenue that are, come in, bring an idea, and let's see if we can come up with something. There's accelerators, which are, come in with your existing idea, let's see if we can scale it and get it really going much, much faster, right? But common is probably closer to the latter. Um, these companies are basically, like, the number one thing that has always been the biggest problem in the past with, with all of these innovations is 
I need to figure out my break even point. I need to figure out how much money I can afford to put into this idea and whether or not I'm wasting money by putting too much, too little in, right? This is why you see a lot of lean startup development where they're going to do a minimum viable product, see if people care enough about that, and then add a little bit more. It's, it's you're maximizing your learning and you're minimizing your cash burn by using that method. That's the idea. With crowdfunding, you can now focus much more on just prototype level development. If you go look at most of these campaigns, they have a really good prototype and you need a really good prototype. You need to prove that you know how to do the product development. But you don't have to do any of the logistics, the sales, the sales and marketing and other things that can cost and take a ton of time to actually still kill your business. Um, I worked on LoveSack, right? LoveSack was uh, one of my, um, yes, co-founder of LoveSack. And entirely different than Scrooge. Nice. <laughs> I appreciate it. May have some of my blood, sweat, and or tears on someone. Um, Lovesack had great profit margins. We sold bean bags for six hundred dollars. Here was the problem: our growth rates were so high that we would get kicked in the ass every single time we had to triple our order from Asia. Every single time we ordered, I think two or three years. We had, I sold out every single day during the Olympics, and I used to deliver at eight a.m. and get a call at noon that were out of inventory. It was stressed and most likely black. Um, crowdfunding helped solve that problem. We could have focused on building eight kick-ass prototypes, put up a web page that quite frankly you can do really, really inexpensively, place an order of 12, 10 million, whatever dollars in revenue, and then just go order them and have them ship directly to that customer's front door. We didn't need a retail space. I mean, it totally would have flipped the business model and the reality of my most after experience is you can have positive, huge, fantastic profit margins that look great, but you can also spend yourself and do a negative cash balance that can run your company into the ground. Um, we had all the demand in the world, but there was a logistics chain problem that actually caused a ton of the issues with it. Order from China can take a long time, and in the crowdfunding context, people are actually really getting used to those three-month wait periods. They're okay with it. I've got a coolest cooler that I still haven't received, and it is now eight months late. Right? Yeah. So. We have a question from YouTube land. Um, his name is Michael Bakumian. I want to raise money to take prototype to next step. I have the CBD, which is cannabis, cannabis, cannabinoid, oh, cannabinoid oil, oil, yeah, oil. product that we have developed and have test products ready to raise money to expand. I also have a friend that wants to expand SaaS product from idea to prototype. His interest from what are the best steps? What is a good plan to follow for crowdfunding? What are the best crowdfunding platforms for SaaS? And then he says I should have been there. But um, it kind of encapsulates sure. what Kirkland talked about here, but sure. into um, um, a product for uh, something that could be questionable legality and a product that's SaaS. Um, the, okay, so this is possible. Uh, cannabis is one of those other spaces that I wish I liked it because it would be a fantastic place to be putting your business dollars right now because it's going to make a lot of money. Um, tell them to look at CannaFunder because there is a cannabis based crowdfunding platform that just focuses on those types of technology. In most cases, if you're pre revenue, blanket statement, if you are pre revenue, I would absolutely go the Kickstarter slash Indiegogo route. It allows you to test your market, it allows people that know you to let it genuinely tell you what they actually think about your product, and it allows you to establish your initial track record of people want this and we have revenue. Once you actually try to go and raise equity money, or even if you want to go and just get a loan, even from a private bank, whether or not you want to try a peer-to-peer -peer strategy, that gives you better valuations, it gives you lower interest rates, um, it'll let you keep more control of your company. It also has an awesome effect of, oftentimes, you'll see a lot of these Y Combinators and other kind of uh, accelerators, um, they'll actually require crowdfunding campaigns now as one of the hurdles to entry, because it's another validator that banks Quite have, haven't quite figured it out, but they know that if you can do a successful crowdfunding, at the very least, you have an idea that people want, and we can take one of these variables that causes uh, businesses to go under under out of the equation. Um, I've had some conversations with banks that were trying to figure out how to use crowdfunding campaigns to mitigate their risk factors. It's really smart. As soon as they figure it out, they'll probably be back in the game right now. If I was a bank, I would be very, very nervous because people aren't even thinking of me as a viable option. I better get back there. Um, so, blanket statement, if you're pre-revenue, go Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or some other um, pre-sales, pre-perks-based uh, campaign. It'll give you a lot of the data and a lot of the buy-in that you need to actually go into an equity raise. You can go and do an equity raise first, um, but if you do that, you're going to have to compensate with a really experienced team, 
you're going to have more battles on whether or not your valuation is correct. You're probably going to give up more of your company and get a lower valuation just because they're going to have a higher risk profile for you. They want more data, but you can move that data. And a lot of a lot of the uh, the assets, the marketing assets that you use from your Kickstarter Indiegogo campaign, really contains a ton of the exact same data and terms and everything else that you're going to need for an equity raise. They actually transfer over, and there's quite a bit of overlap between the two. Um, so I would go that route. It'll set you up for the next one, and then you have an equity campaign. The really cool, cool, really interesting thing you want to know about the uh, equity raises in a handful of the places where they've done longitudinal long-term studies on how this equity campaign impacts uh, companies is really awesome. You don't get just an investor, you get a brand ambassador. So imagine in a year or two, my hypothesis of what's going on, we're, uh, what's the best food shop in Salt Lake? Who's got Hulu for you? Name one, anyone. What's nearby, Joel? Harmon. Is Harmon's Utah based? Yeah. Okay, Associated cool. food chip. Imagine you can go to Harmon's and uh, you're going through the checkout counter and they have an RFID chip that says uh, not just your local grocer, uh, but your locally owned grocer owned by you. You can scan your phone and for a hundred bucks you now become an investor in Harmon's, right? hundred bucks. All that expensive. But you like Harmon's, right? They've never done your own thus far. You just gave them a hundred bucks. They're going to have some expenses that are associated with you, right? They're going to have to do some investor updates. They're going to pay a little bit of money up, but most of it's going to be online and it's going to be automated. So it's not going to be all that expensive. They uh, gave you, or you gave them a hundred bucks. They just got a customer for life. They just got a brand ambassador that is going to say, well, I have all the options in the universe. If you go on to your phone and you're in Draper or something else, you're going to look for a Harmon's first. If you own part of it, why would you not want them to do better? So the added cool side effect of this is not just did you actually get the capital, but you've got a long-term awesome relationship with your customer. If it's a restaurant or other chain and someone comes into town, like uh, is Spitz, you saw them? I don't know if it is. I like Spitz, right? These are the, the shawarma rats yonder, somewhere there. Um, but if someone comes into town and they say, hey, take me somewhere good to eat, guess where I'm going to go? The place where I own stock. Um, I totally believe in what they're going to do, but for the next 10 years, they just got my business and they got all the business from my friends. And when people ask, hey, what should we eat tonight? I'm going to try to get them to go to space. Um, for that reason, the longitudinal studies are seeing that companies are surviving at an 80% rate after five years. It's creating better companies that are lasting longer, that have happier employees, that have more salespeople that are unpaid in the process. Um, so this opens up a ton of really cool innovation. Transparency in the market makes it a lot harder. It also means that when you're looking for, hey, what should my financial statements and my offer look like? You've now got Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and 10 other platforms where you can go research other guys that have raised money, exactly what they did, what their financials look like. And you can use that as a basis and research model for what you should be doing, which means you're probably going to have a better business model. We're going to get better business models, more investors, more innovation, less failures, and it's going to be harder to defraud it because most of these are working and based off word of mouth and people aren't going to promote what they know is a scam. It's really hard to get away with. So this stuff's cool. I'm really excited about it. I, I feel like we just invented bank loans and then early next year we're going to start seeing them come to fruition. Like it's a ton of capital that's going to be released into the market and it's from the average Joe. I and mean, that's the coolest part of crowdfunding. Um, it's the people around you bringing it to life and making it possible. So awesome. yeah. Any other questions? There's one coming in, but I don't know if he wants me to. Yep. Okay, I'll bring it up. Um, I will not uh, uh, divulge who this is. <laughs> Do you think it's possible, and uh, this may be something you're comfortable or not comfortable um, answering, to do a corporate takeover using crowdfunding? Could customers Ooh. of a business literally pull together their resources for a hostile takeover utilizing? what now exists in crowdfunding. Oh, this, no, <laughs> this is the super cool thing about crowdfunding too. Um, this is a brilliant idea. I don't know about the legalities of that, um, but the applications for crowdfunding is so much broader than just paying some bills and helping people raise for a company. Um, you hear, like, you'll see these things in the news where athletes are now basically crowdfunding their own athletic contracts. So, if you give me a hundred grand now, I'll give you X percent of my professional athletic contract over the next 10 years. Yes. Um, I've had people that are talking about actually, uh, this is one of my other really favorite ones. Um, instead of going and getting a student loan, 
um, have someone invest in a student and then get a rev share of their income for the next 10 years. Or the rest of their life. Or the rest of their life, yeah. But now you have two people that are really focused on not putting that person in debt. They haven't gotten anywhere. You have two people that are really focused on trying to make that individual make as much money as they possibly can. Right? It takes a village. Imagine if you're crowdfunding a student loan and you now have 50 people that have a rev share in your future and they immediately and directly benefit if you have a better income next year versus the year after that versus the year after that. So really what you're looking at here, it may not be a hostile takeover. It may be a capital raise, which is utilized for the hostile takeover. I, I, like, I don't know about the legalities of that, but I would not absolutely in no way, shape, or form put that past the crowd. If you saw, wow, they, it's, it's political movements. I mean, it's phenomenal what these groups can do now that a dollar is still a viable contribution, right? Like, I don't know how long we're gonna, we're going to need before a dollar investment is still economically viable. Um, but you see this, like, if it, whether they're great causes or terrible ones, you know, potato salad, if you guys didn't see that, with a kid making a joke um, about crowdfunding, essentially he said, I want you guys to crowdfund my potato salad. And he made a campaign on Kickstarter that basically said, I'm trying to raise 10 bucks and I'm gonna make potato salad. And then he put a bunch of joke perks associated with it. Come get a bite of the salad, $1. I'll give you the recipe, $5. You raised 60 grand, 60 grand. Um, the, if the crowd, attracts and attaches themselves to a, a, a cause that they can get behind, um, they're very much capable of some very, very cool things. So I would not put that past. I don't, I, you know, I don't know about the exact logistics of how you would do it, um, but based on the other conversations that I've had on other people's ideas, we're still very much on the early, early end of what we can do with all this. Um, and I think that I, I, that would be awesome. I'd love to actually see that. That'd be pretty fun. Um, Jeff, other questions? You guys want to see one? Um, give me one second. But overall, I mean, the, the, the fun part about this is just how much new innovation at lower risk you guys now have available to you it's the creators and the consumers the they call it the disintermediation of what do you want to call it technology eating the world and stuff like that we're already at a spot where jobs that require creativity are almost 2x in demand from those where people are just turning around um, it means that people are going to be much more incentivized if they aren't thinking on their own if they aren't coming up with really interesting innovative stuff they're probably worried they probably are going to be on a board. They're going to have very different incentives to become creative, uh, which means we're probably at the very beginning of another renaissance era because of stuff like this, which is why it's growing so quickly and has such an exponential kind of uh, curve. It's going to have some phenomenal, phenomenal impact on us. Um, this is another one that I just, sorry, we have this one coming up and it's just one of our, our this is a nonprofit, but it's one that I really like. Um, you guys hear this? Are they going to be able to hear this still? Um, I don't have you hooked up to the speaker, but um, I'll talk to it. One of the other uses, and this is where nonprofits can come in, is that they can actually get people that collaboratively participate instead of just one person asking for a donation or whatever, they can enable other people to generate their own ideas to contribute to a specific campaign. Um, and this see if I can talk through it, but uh, this one, I don't know if you guys have seen the statistics on human trafficking, but it's crazy. Um, people go through, honestly, unspeakable hell. Uh, Two million people all over the planet, 100,000 in the United States. Um, Stephanie's mom was caught up in one of these human trafficking rings. Her, mom, her mom's mom was caught up in one of those third generations that was stuck in one of these, and she was the first kid to get out of that cycle. Um, and she started the Child Rescue Association, and they now fund Green Beret and Delta Force guys to go into foreign countries where those child trafficking rings are taking place. And in this case, or at least in this specific instance, uh, we're funding an undercover mission in a Latin American country. And they're going to go in and they're going to do sting operations and break up that sex trafficking ring. 
Um, so people in the United States can basically participate and actually change some really significant lives in another country. Um, beyond that, they're funding and taking any of the extra funds and they're funding another orphanage from another sting operation that they already conducted. So after these kids, these, these kids really, besides the obvious of just the horrible stuff that they have to do once they're done and the people that have them locked down will prevent them from getting educations, learning any professional skills because it gives them any other alternative. Which means oftentimes even if they get rescued they have no other skill set and they go back to this willing so these guys are breaking up those rings they're setting up orphanages and counseling and giving them uh, real life skill sets so they can actually get out of their, 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 their this life so that's crazy there was a there was an article in cnn the other day that had one of the girls that had been rescued from a ring she was in one for four years and they estimated she was raped forty-three thousand times Forty-three thousand. um so this one is going to be going up on Indiegogo uh, in about next week. Um, and uh, it's going to be a really cool one. I mean, you can find out, you know, to go to the disintermediation, the disintermediation of it. Five bucks is economically viable for them to ask for. And that five bucks, it just feeds a kid for a day. hundred bucks gives them uh, the $100 they need for all of their, their aftercare and support for an entire month. And their um, 1800 bucks is on average the cost to get an entire kid rescued. What's the difference in the end money that goes to a cause here with a traditional charity and the administrative costs that go into a traditional charity or cause? Yeah. This one's going straight to the. This one's going straight there. So. Versus like a dilution of like 80, 90 percent in the traditional. Yeah, yeah, this one's going there. I mean, I think on a couple of the rewards where they have t-shirts and stuff that may be incorporated in, but these are mission funds. So. Sorry to cut some. No, appreciate it. Sure. Does the company have to have, I mean, in, in this case, they don't necessarily have a cause of them giving them. The company, they do. The company that's doing a mm -hmm. crowdfunding sure. sale, do they have to offer the mm -hmm. investor some sort of. You gotta be, yeah, okay. So, in an equity scenario, okay, let me answer this on two, two tiers. If you're doing a non equity raise, you don't have to offer anything. These guys have a handful of perks that they call them that they are because they are giving you like they have um doing t-shirts um since some of their staff is like former special little operations and stuff uh they're taking people out and they're showing you they're you know if you uh for like i think it's 300 bucks you'll, you can get a, a firearms shooting range course with a former delta force operative um they have some escape and evasion courses that a couple of special ops guys are actually teaching so they're doing some you don't have to on the equity side, you have to be much more careful about the quote unquote perks of it. Um, the SEC and these guys get really nervous when you start mixing non monetary incentives into the equation. They want everyone to be treated equally. Um, they get very nervous if someone gets a different deal than another person that was engaged in the same raise. You can get around it to some extent by doing different raises in chronological progression. So you can do a convertible note first and the people that fund that much of your capital because they're getting a little bit more risk may get a better return and they get a convertible number right? it's more desirable. another tranche of funding on a different raise that is maybe just would be and they get different terms from the people in the first scenario offerings a little bit that they usually need, um, so there is no confusion and usually when it comes to perks and stuff like that every time i've had people ask for it we've, we've thrown it to attorneys um, every single time they said you can have a home page, but you need to have cut it in half and have this button go to a reward campaign and then have this button go to an equity campaign and make sure that there is no mixing between the two whatsoever. Um, so it's going to lot, but they avoid every time. <laughs> every lawyer I've ever mentioned it to started getting choked up and very nervous and just said, don't even bother, it'll, it'll get you in hot water. Sure. I was just wondering if there's a place I've got a whole lot of people who want to do crowdfunding
like an ongoing series. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, Joel. I think that the tie into groups like the circle, the SL circle, the uh, product association of Utah, made in Utah, and um, in essence, knowing that there's um, educational demand, kind of going back to where two and a half, three years ago, there were quite a few meetings specifically on the use case. Um, if there were an ability to start on something that's like quarterly and to develop it into curriculum, it would go out of the realm of being a networking group application and um, actually become something where Thor, who's um, an attorney, or Dan, who is a content guy, or Scott, who's um, a governmental guy, could provide perspective that is not regulatory back into a learning environment. That's what I'd like to do, and actually move into a weekly kind of situation. The amazing thing about Utah is you've probably got here within the, the Utah ecosystem probably 20 to 30 percent of the preeminent experts per se on crowdfunding. Here. So I don't see it being that much of a push, and if not, being able to do something virtual um, to be able to bring in something, we, we certainly have the contacts with this on CFPA. We've got Judy Robinette here, Richard Swart here, and they would probably be interested in being able to have some real world feedback. But I'd encourage it not just being premise based, but something that would be on uh, the street. And, uh, oh, no, I, I would very much like to see things like that. So I'd like to contact whatever it is. Perhaps we'll have a little bit of time because we want to one favor for that too. Awesome. Yeah, if you guys don't have any other questions, uh, uh, that's oh, yeah. I apologize to you because I don't know this is the one I want. <laughs> yes. um, cool. Thank you. With regard to crowdfunding, are you allowed to give swag on like t-shirts and hats and membership without having to like, report or support? That, once you give out stuff like that, does that throw you into a reporting category? Are you allowed to? talking about like a Kickstarter or anything, yeah, right? Yeah, you can do whatever you want. Can you just say hundred dollars for your T-shirt? Mm -hmm. kind of no, I mean it'll make it to your P&L and stuff like that, just because you're obviously gonna have to buy the T-shirt. But right. no, you're not really reporting. No, there's all, there's literally almost no regulation associated with that side. If you go look at the terms and conditions of the Kickstarters and Indiegogos, you'll um, see prominently that they don't have to do anything for you. Period. Um, yeah, no. Um, what you want to watch out for, and what people do get in the hot water for, is basically just angering that crowd. Um, most of the time, the people that are promoting you know who you are, know you personally. Uh, they're all pretty smart. If they wanted to look you up, they could look you up and figure you know, like, you know, there are definitely cases where people screwed up and had people literally knock on your door. Um, but no, like from a regulatory, do I have to tell people that I gave out a t shirt and stuff? No, I mean, it'll be documented. But once you put these things up on, say, a Kickstarter and Indiegogo, they stay up. Uh, pass fail. They'll be up. It's there. Um, so it's still in, it's documented and it's available. But yeah, it's, I wouldn't worry about that. As the slides didn't come across too well on YouTube, do you have any objection to converting that into a PDF? And, no. Uh, nope. We'll put that up. No, I've been getting yelled at by my. Thank you for not doing enough stuff on the slide share. Is that okay? Yeah, slide share be fine. Just as long as um, we, we gathered everybody's um, email addresses that are attending, and we'll attach it to the YouTube as well. Cool. Cool, cool. Um, there's no other questions. Just break, guys. But I appreciate the time. Thanks. Yeah. Appreciate having me. And as a plug to um, uh, um, Polo Deck for this uh, we have this uh, here on a weekly basis. If there's any subjects, much like uh, you're talking about that you'd like to see um, within this forum, let us know. We're always looking for speakers. So we may or may not, because of some other things going on, have a, um, a session next week, um, a week before the Thanksgiving break. But um, if this is your first time at Holodeck, and I don't see any folks that are too terribly new, um, please talk to Andy. She'll walk you around with uh, what we offer here from uh, the um, uh, co-working as well as the incubator and accelerator space that we have. 
And um, if any of you are thinking of uh, being able to be in a position to raise money, you now have additional tools and you um, have access to, give, access to give to some of the preeminent um, um, experts per se in what um, can be done with crowdfunding. The, the one take that I'll close with is with crowdfunding, not everything is possible, but you've got something where you can push the envelope and the crowd will be honest to make sure you've got stamps here. And in all the years of securities, um, pink sheets over the counter and everything else, they haven't been able to figure that out. But with this, when you have a lot of people that are out there trying to be able to make sure that they're not being defrauded too, it's a lot safer. And I, I think your, your numbers are correct. And I think the four cases of fraud within equity um, were, um, that's international numbers. Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was pretty low. <laughs> if that even makes sense, I was very, very surprised that it was so there was one last question from uh, the chats sure. have you seen equity partners wait on the sidelines and watch a crowdfunding project um, grow and then jump in if the project gains momentum uh, uh, if they mean like do a rewards raise and then jump in later no it would be an equity um, uh, um, another thing about Dan he won't give himself credit on this you project manage launched 150 equity platforms? Uh, uh, I, I helped uh, organize probably the first year or two of Crowd Engine. Um, I was their VP of marketing. Um, it's a software as a service platform, and they did uh, they did everything from you know fundme.com. They did the first, and I was project lead on um, Carlton Group, which was one of the first equity platforms to have over a billion dollars in assets on it. Um, and uh, to date, they it's over 100. So. Uh, yeah. So, like, you would have speculators on the side with, like, an IPO or something like that, watching value coming in and then <clears throat> jumping on the value once the, the hockey stick has occurred. Is there any type of precedent with people speculating what's going on with them? Um, it's kind of a different set of rules, isn't it? It is a different set of rules, but a lot of the marketing campaigns roll out relatively similarly. Um, if you're doing, if you're doing a, a standard Kickstarter raise, you go and offline before your campaign goes live. You organize a bunch of people that you know personally, friends, relatives, partners, whatever, and get them to do the same thing to, to establish and, and uh, uh, get a soft commitment that they're going to contribute to your campaign before it starts too. That way, the day that your campaign goes live, you have this initial bump that makes you look really good because no one wants to be the first guy to invest in a platform or into a deal that only has zero, right? No one wants to be first. You secure those commitments up front so that no one sees zero. Everyone's got 20%. And if you're getting 20%, 20% on your first day, and most of these raises are between 30 and 60 days, it's a pretty good bet they're going to be successful. The same premise does work on the equity side. You go through, you talk to some of the people that are already in the role of decks that may probably be investors. You go and you organize and you strategize to let them know, hey, we want you to invest. We'd like to, you to invest really early. Will you help us out? You know, is there anything else? They can go and invest. Um, and then that bump, that same 20 to 30 percent, depending on who you talk to, is what gains that interest and that social validation that then, that then gets the press to look at you. The press needs to talk about your story before it's successful so they actually look like they've got their finger on the pulse of technology and whatever else. Um, once they get in, then the larger partners and the, the people that don't know you start to have enough validation between all right, people that know them will invest. The, the technical professionals or the, the influencer bloggers in this space all think that this is a good idea. Um, they don't have a track record, but I've got enough information that it's worth investing in. And that's how you kind of roll those three groups together. And they, in both spaces, they act the same. So yes, they will wait on the sidelines. It's your job to organize who you have and who influences the market to get the people that you don't yet know. And that's how you get them. And one last question for me before I wrap it. Please, I'm sure Dan will answer any one-on-one -on -one questions any of you have. What's probably the best example of a product that we all know now, that we're all familiar with, that started with crowdfunding, and what kind of market cap have they um, accomplished? True. I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of Pebble. I mean, Pebble was, are you guys familiar with Pebble, the digital e-ink watch? Bet your money there's someone in this. Long before, before I, long before I watched, long before I'm here. Yeah, these guys were the first, first watch watch. Um, and if you want to, I mean, way before the technology existed, in some form, the Statue of Liberty was actually crowdfunded. Um, um, but uh, 
they did it via newspapers and stuff. Um, the Pebble Watch was rejected by like, I can't remember how many VC firms in Silicon Valley, like 10, some, like pretty much everyone turned them down. They went and created their Kickstarter campaign, they raised 10 million bucks and guess who started calling immediately? Oh, whoa, it looks like we've made a huge mistake. Um, and most of the data that comes from these longitudinal studies on VC firms versus just the crowd selecting which campaigns really succeed, the crowd is seemingly at least on par with any VC expert out there. Um, so not as good as the smartest, but above average or on average. So um, the crowd's actually pretty smart. Um, and uh, Pebble Watch now, I don't know how much money they've done since, but they've got a huge company. They own way more equity than they would have in the other scenario. All of those professional VCs on Sand Hill Road and everywhere else turned them down, much to their chagrin at this point. Um, and uh, yeah, it kicked off the entire e ink watch phenomenon. And uh, many, many people still think it's the best one because technology is like a week battery life instead of a day. Um, and they're all over the place, but I guarantee there's someone in this building that's learned. Cool. All right, in closing, um, thank you for coming and attending um, another SL Circle event. We have our marquee event with the marketing boot camp on Tuesday at um, the uh, Founders Room, Zions Bank. We'd love to be able to see you up there. Um, we're also um, supporting the Big Mountain Data um, Conference, which is going on um, at the BU. Last year, they had 800 people. They have space for about 1,200 this year. If you have any interest in um, anything Speak Geek, um, check it out. Go to Geek Events. It's uh, listed on our website. And then check out what they have going on next year, because um, information truly is our, our, our currency now. And um, understanding what happens in this space, even if you're not a data scientist, even if you're not an engineer, it's imperative, in my opinion, to you know um, what to be able to do with it. Um, the marketing boot camp will be fantastic. We've actually got a professor from that school, the David Eccles, David Fox Eccles School, that is uh, presenting uh, next Tuesday. Uh, we also have our bar crawl next week, SL crawl. You can check that out on Meetup too. Always a good time and always very good information. And uh, with that, I'll close. Uh, we thank you for coming. We'll post something if indeed we do an event next week, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yes,